he's taken away and my pain is healed in his name i believe oh i believe i'll raise a banner this my lord Return to our seats and remain standing. If you could return to your seats and remain standing, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father, and we just thank you for your, your grace and your goodness, Father. Father, I ask that, that we just, uh, today, Father, that we just remove all the things, the things that, are, that interfere with our relationship with you, Father, that right now we forget about them, Father, and we truly spend time with us, with you today, Father. Father, I pray not for an emotional movement, Father, but a movement of our hearts, Father. Father, that you speak to us, Father. You speak to us uh, intimately and personally, Father. We thank you for all you do in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes a whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for all you've done for me Back into order, who makes the orphans a son and daughter, the king of glory, the king above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all its brilliance, the king of glory. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. 
Worthy is the Lamb who was slain And worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King Worthy, worthy This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Jesus I sing for All you've done for me spoke a word you were singing over me you've been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you've been so so kind to me Overwhelming 
Amen. Thank you, guys. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Good to see you today. Hi, Raymond. How you doing, bud? <laughs> it's good to see each and every one of you. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Yeah. I am, too. Listen, we've got a lot of folks that are out running around and moving the neighborhood and crossing the street and other parts of the state. So let's pray for a lot of our church family that's out making Thanksgiving family visits this week. And Glad that you're here to celebrate with us. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper at the latter part of our service today. So I am especially glad you're here because it's a great time of communion for our service as well. So uh, praise the Lord. God is good to us. Amen? Amen. Listen, uh, I want to make a brief announcement. Many of y'all know that a month or so ago we celebrated uh, Stacy Dutton's anniversary, work anniversary, 20 years. So you praise the Lord. So that was the good news. The bad news is that uh, she has left us for another job. She's going grandmothering full time. So uh, she's not going anywhere. She's here. But y'all just, everybody all just stand up and give Stacy a round of applause for her ministry. This is her last week to be at the church to serve in that capacity. <laughs> blessings, amen, and blessings. Hallelujah. And you may be seated, but Stacy, we appreciate you and thank you. Can't thank you enough. I'm sure we'll be calling you all the time. <laughs> so you might have considered moving out of state with that change. But. Praise the Lord. Listen, I appreciate Stacy because it's been more than a job. It's been a ministry for her, and uh, uh, this as well as grandmothering is a ministry as well. But uh, we appreciate you putting up with Pastor Tim and Gary. I don't know how you did it. I'm sure it was quite easy working with me for 20 years, but praise the Lord. But we are glad. We're going to talk about uh, continuing in our series on the, the, is Jesus really coming soon? To which the answer is an obvious, yeah. amen. Uh, but we're going to talk about part five of this series in the marriage lamb and what that means in Scripture and how it pl plays out in the end-time scenario of events. We've looked each week at, uh, uh, at, a, at a chart that we've kind of laid out, tried to lay out the, the highlights of the, of, the, of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think I clicked, there we go. And we talked about kind of an overview of the whole events of the last tribulation to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You know, it carries out such as this. We have the church age. We preached a sermon what the church age is. This time and period will end, though, with the rapture or the translation, as some theologians call it, of the church, where we're caught up to be with the Lord in there. That's not the second coming, all right? That's the rapture of the church, all right? Those who are Christians who, who, uh, who have died before us, they'll be resurrected, and the Bible says, then we which are alive will be caught up with the Lord. That's not the Old Testament saints, all right? That's the church. That's the bride of Christ is what this particular resurrection is all about. And then while we're going up, I believe during this period of time, somehow, somewhere, some way, seven years of hell on earth is part of this process. We call it the tribulation. Daniel talks about the 70th week of Daniel. Revelation talks about it in great detail. We'll talk about that seven years and what's involved when this judgment on the earth takes place. And God deals with Israel very uniquely and specifically during the time of the tribulation. Because really, that's what that, the tribulation is really about. It's about bringing Israel back to the Father and restoring their covenant with, with the Father. But meanwhile, up above, the church is being dealt with in a very unique way. We talked about the season of great praise. A week and a half, two weeks ago, we talked about the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat of Christ. We talked about the believer's judgment in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We talked about how every believer is going to stand there in judgment. And then there's going to follow the marriage of the Lamb. As that period of time ends, approximately perhaps seven years, tribulation ends with the repairing of the Lord Jesus Christ in the air with us. And then he touches his foot down the Mount of Olives takes the seat in the throne of David in the temple in Jerusalem. That begins the second advent, we call it. The, the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ begins at that point. And for a thousand years, prosperity like the world has never seen, that closes with the great white throne of judgment. You know, heaven and earth are, 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 are redone, so to say. A new heaven and new earth, and out of that comes eternity for us, and we spend forever with the Lord Jesus Christ and with those saints from the Old Testament and the New Testament, even those who were saved during the tribulation period. But as we look at this chart, I want to focus on a specific part. We've dealt with these issues of the rapture. We've talked about the church age. It's this moment we call the rapture the translation, and then the glorification where we become like Christ as, as we meet him in the air. 
Then there's that season of praise that's followed by the marriage of the Lamb in Revelation 19. So that's where we're going to focus our message today. And we're going to move from that right into the Lord's Supper. And I want to show you the parallel of, of something in regard to that as well. But as you look at the marriage of the Lamb, this is a unique moment in history. And the Bible is very clear about this particular event. In Revelation chapter 19, it says these verses. So let's stand as we honor the reading of the word. Just two verses we'll look at and we'll look at some others later in the message. But he said, let us rejoice. And by the way, that's a good time to rejoice, right? And let us be glad and let us give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Somebody say amen. amen. And you may be seated. You know, in the, there's many in the New Testament passages that talk about this relationship between those of us who come to know Jesus Christ and how he is the bridegroom and how everyone that's come to know Jesus since, the, since, the, since Pentecost be, become part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every Christian now makes up the body of Christ, which is also known in Scripture as the bride of Christ. Paul talks about the bride of Christ in several passages in Romans. Chapter 7, verse 4, he talks about being presented as a virgin because our sins have been washed, we're made clean to the Lord and, and be presented for this, this marriage relationship. 2 Corinthians 11, we're going to talk about it later when it talks about the Lord's Supper where Paul talks about receiving it. But in chapter 2, uh, chapter 11, verse 2, he talks about us being the bride of Christ in our, our, this new relationship. Revelation 19 talks about it here. Uh, other passages that talk about the, the bride of Christ. And Ephesians chapter 5 is, a, is one of those passages that we use a lot of times when we're doing messages on family or the home or in our marriage conferences where it talks about, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, gave himself for her. And he talks about wives, you know, receive your husband and submit to your husbands and, and honor them. And then he goes on and says, but this is a picture, ultimately, our home should be, of the real marriage that he's talking about, which is the marriage of the church and the Lord Jesus Christ. That it represents, in other words, our home should represent this great spiritual relationship between us as a body of believers and the Lord Jesus Christ, where he becomes and he is the bridegroom, you know, and we make up the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a picture of our relationship, Lord. It's a love relationship, the greatest love story ever told, how we've been made right with God and how he came. He died on the cross and he paid the price for our sins. If you follow uh, uh, the Jewish wedding and how Judas' wedding unfolds, Pastor Strickland did a great job on teaching that series at one time, how the, the, the groom comes and, and pays the dowry and pays the price to receive the bride. and Then he goes and prepares a place for all that's happening now, place is being prepared for us. And then one day he's going to come and receive this, this bride unto himself, and there'll be what we call, in Scripture here, it's called the marriage of the Lamb. It's a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and every one of us who know Jesus making up the body of Christ, we become and are the bride of Christ. Now, the time of this marriage is revealed in Scripture, and on the chart I kind of showed it there, following the Bema seat of Christ, you know. First of all is this translation or the rapture, the taking away the church, all right? And if you haven't been here for the series, maybe you're just getting in on this, if you'll go to our YouTube channel or you go to our Facebook channel, you'll play on the web, you'll find these sermons, recent sermons have been on there. But there's even more depth that's on our YouTube channel. You can go back and pull up uh, some, just search our, our channel for, for messages on the second coming and the end times, and a lot of these will come up describing different in even more detail than what I'm doing in this particular series about the tribulation and some other events. But you'll see this is a unique time because right now as we said with the chart, we'll go, the, the, the church has been brought into the presence of Jesus Christ in the heavenlies, all right? He lifted us off the planet supernaturally. The dead in Christ have been raised from the, from the graves. We've been caught up to be with the Lord, those that are alive. And so the Bible says we go to be with the Lord. We go into heaven. There's this celebration season. Then there's the, 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 what we talked about two weeks ago, the, the Bema Seat of Christ. And the Bible tells us that the Bema Seat of Christ, if you remember, uh, that we're, we stand before the Lord and our works have, are tried. And our, our, our lives are going to be made evident as Christians how we lived them for the glory of God or how we didn't live them for the glory of God. He talks about we're tried by souls by fire. And the works of our life, our Christian life, if it's just wood, hay, and stubble, oh, well, that's a material that's just temporal. It, it goes up in the flames. It's not going to last. But then he says the things that are gold and silver, all right, and precious jewel, well, what are those things? Those are the things that we do for the glory of God in our life. Those are the things that I do to honor Christ with my walk in my life. That's those Ephesians 2.10 things. You say, what's that verse? Well, 2.8.9 talks about we're saved by grace through faith. 
Verse 10 says, And now we've been recreated in Christ Jesus unto good works that he has preordained that we should walk in them. In other words, God has a plan for your life. As you live out God's purpose for your life, as you honor the Lord with your time, with your talents, with your treasures, with your heart, those, that, those are the things of value. Those are the things which stand the test of, of the, the Bema seed of Jesus Christ. Those are the things which we receive rewards for because we lived a life that was a spirit-filled life living for the glory of God. As it pictures in Ephesians 5 with a spirit-filled man and a spirit-filled woman experiencing the joy of their relationship as they just abide by the will of God and by the word of God. But this time of this marriage is, is, is this moment in heaven after the Bema seat. And part of that is the reason because of what he even talks about, that the bride is cl clothed in and, and the importance of having the fine linen on. But it's, it's taken place, again, you know, at, at this moment in time, right before, as we call it, the second advent, this millennial reign of Jesus Christ, all right? And it, it becomes clear that it's taken place already right before the millennium because it says the marriage of the Lamb is come. And as I say on the, the overhead uh, presentation, there it says, it is the origin tense in the Greek language, all right? It, it's, it's a word which has to do with elthin, and it means it's already completed. It's happened. The marriage of the Lamb has now taken place. The marriage of the Lamb has come. It's here. It's done. It's taken place. When does it take place? Right here before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Again, that's not the rapture. So there's obvious when you start to look at the logistics. I mean, I know we all love stuff in chronological order. At least I do. Helps my poor little mind figure it out a little better. You see it's right after the rapture, right before the second coming of Jesus Christ, somewhere after the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. Where does this marriage of the Lamb take place? Well, it obviously has to take place in heaven. After this Bema seat, judgment's taken place. And that's all in the heavenlies. The church has returned with the Lord into the heavens with him and, and the Lord. And so the marriage takes place in heaven. In fact, there's no other real location given in Scripture for this marriage to happen but in heaven. The participants, well, that's those of us who truly do know Jesus Christ. All right? Now, if you're just religious, I hate to tell you, you ain't going to make it. <laughs> All right, it's not going to work. All right, just religion don't cut it. You have to know Jesus personally. Well, how does that happen? Well, there's an introduction, just like you get to know anybody else. And then there's a, an acceptance of the relationship. And then you follow Christ. The Bible says that Jesus said, if it's safe to repent, you shall all likewise perish. In other words, repentance has to do that change of direction, that, that change of, of focus in our life, the change of priorities in our life. Then now I have this new relationship and it starts and ends and follows through with the grace and the power of Jesus Christ. All right? you know, that, that I'm living in him and living for him now. That's, that's, that's relationship. That goes beyond religion. And we can be, have a relationship with Jesus and be religious. And you can be relig religious and not have a relationship with Jesus. All right? But the important thing here is that this is for those people who have had a personal relationship with Christ, whom he indwells, all right? whom he lives in because of their faith commitment to Jesus Christ. Those are the ones who are involved in this relationship and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just for a lack of clarity here, remember at the rapture, who comes out of the graves? Those who are died and in Christ, right? This is not the Old Testament saints, all right? So they're not part of this the marriage of the Lamb, all right? That's Israel. That's another covenant. And we'll talk about that as we go in the series. And neither is it the tribulation saints. Now, obviously, there's some observation. People have been dying during the tribulation and coming to heaven, all right, because they haven't taken the mark of the beast. They've been committed to follow Jesus, even at the cost of their life. But church age is done. The bride is settled. It's taken care of. I, 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 they're invited later to the wedding feast we'll talk about in a moment. But this is for those of you who know Jesus Christ. So if you want to be part of this wedding party, get in now, all right? This is not where you can, yeah, I'm going to come back later and think about it some more. We do not know at any moment what time, what moment, what hour it will be when the Lord says, okay, I'm getting the bride. I'm going to go get my bride. It's just going to come, and it's going to be done, and we, we get to participate in it. Now, it says that we'll be dressed in the fine linen, and that passage we read a while ago said the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Well, what is that? That's what survived the Bema seat, all right? So at the Bema seat, we're getting the wrinkles out. <laughs> at the Bema seat, we're seeing what's worthy to honor Christ with. Now, we know that Paul said we're not found in our own righteousness. That's not what this is talking about. 
All right? We are, we'll always be dressed in all eternity in the righteousness of Christ Jesus that he gave us because he died on the cross for our sins and made us right with God. I can't strut my own stuff in heaven. Amen. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But I can glorify God with my life now, and that which is done for the glory of God in my life right now will adorn us at this wedding feast. Now, those of you who have been brides, you know you don't wear your wedding dress every day. You wear it one time, right? Seems like kind of a waste, all that money. But nonetheless. <laughs> so there's this moment at this event called the marriage of the Lamb where we're not only adorned in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the garments of righteousness, but they're also this adornment of the things that were honored the Lord, the gold, the silver, the precious jewels. In other words, the righteous deeds. He says the righteous acts of the saints. All right? Those are the things that we were, are rewarded for. What I did for the glory of God. What I did with my, my mouth. What I did with my life. What I did with my actions. What I did with my talents. What I did with my, my time and the things God blessed me with. Did I honor him? My treasures. Did I, did I honor the Lord with, with what he blessed me with? Those are the things. These are the righteous acts of the saints. So let me just ask you a question. What are you doing to get your gown ready? All right? Don't want you showing up naked. It's not going to work that way. <laughs> All right? What are you doing to get your gown ready? Because that's important, and it's important. Now, we know that we're not saved by faith. I mean, we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith, right? Let me get that clear. We're not, we're not saved by our works, but works are important as Christians and as believers. We honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's really important that we come to this place we understand this is the marriage of the Lamb. It's taking place in heaven. And, folks, let me just say this as clearly and as simply as I can. This will be the ultimate experience of your entire Christian life. I mean, yes, we're going to enjoy heaven for eternity, but this moment. It's, you know, some of y'all remember that when you got married, right? That moment in time. You know, I told my wife yesterday, you said, I can close my eyes and I can see that moment in my mind clearly. I see exactly what you're wearing in my mind. I see exactly what you look like. It's, I can, it's just clear as a bell. You know? And, and it, you know, that day was exciting. It was a blast. It was awesome. It was incredible. It marked the rest of my life and my relationship with my bride. But, hey, that's not even going to hold a hill of beans or compare on any level to this moment when we really experience the presence of God in this kind of relationship and this kind of union like has never been. I mean, this, this is the moment we should all be excited about. Yes, to be caught up in there with the Lord, to be changed in an instant, and then go into this presence and receive rewards for the righteous deeds we did, and then to be united with the Lord in this marriage ceremony. Wow. I mean, my mind almost hurts trying to imagine what that would be like. I mean, we know, I know Jesus. Do you know the Lord? I mean, I do, I know the Lord now, all right? But I, I'm really going to know the Lord in this moment. This is just the, the, the union, the fellowship, the communion beyond anything that we can probably imagine in this life. I mean, to me, it's exciting. And it's something we ought to be looking forward to. And something as a church, and many people don't, but it's something as a church we ought to be preparing for in this marriage moment. Because it's going to be an incredible, it's going to be an incredible moment. Now, it's necessary, as I mentioned a while ago, something about the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb. I think there's a, you need to make this distinction, all right? In this connection, you need to understand there is what we call the marriage of the Lamb, all right? That's when we come, and it's reference to the church, and it takes place in heaven prior to the second coming of Jesus. But the marriage supper is also mentioned in Scripture, and it is different. In fact, this is an event that Israel is invited to. It involves them, and it takes place on the earth, and it takes place during the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Those passages in Matthew 22, when he's preparing the disciples, you know, he's getting ready to go to the cross, and so he's giving them preparation, and he's telling them what the end time, Matthew 24, he talks about what it's going to be like on the last days, and he talks about the signs that are going to happen in the world, and the wars, and the famines, and the pestilence, and he deals with all these end time scenarios, but he also talks about, and gives some parables, remember the, the story of the, of, the, of the virgins being invited to, to the bride, to, to the wedding. That, that's in relationship to the millennial reign of Jesus and the wedding feast that takes place in the millennial reign of Christ, this, this wedding supper. In fact, it is ultimately this a parabolic picture of the whole millennial age, of this time of blessing and this time of prosperity and this time where Jesus reigns on the earth and the Gentile nations and the Jewish nation, they all honor God. And during this millennial reign of Christ, 
the church will have responsibilities, I believe, over the Gentile nations during this particular time. So there's a lot going on, but as you study Scripture, this whole millennial blessing is really, in, in essence, the marriage supper. This whole, that's a, that's a long supper, I know, okay? <laughs> that's a thousand-year reign, but it's a reign of blessing and of prosperity and grace, and it's amazing that, you know, there'll be people even invited into the kingdom during that time, but we'll reject it. I don't want to go, you know, but they, and they won't come, or they won't be prepared. They say, I got something else to do, and they're just not ready. But the marriage of the Lamb takes place in heaven. The marriage supper takes place upon the earth. In Revelation 19, 9 and 10, it says this. Write this, he said unto me. Blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am just your fellow servant. No, this angel says, Don't worship me. I'm just, I'm just one of you guys, all right? I'm just a brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He said, listen, as he reveals all these things in the end times, John is just blown away and he starts to worship this messenger. I think, I'm just a messenger. You don't worship me, worship the Lamb. Worship the Lord of glory. Worship the fact that God's giving you this revelation because the spirit of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So this time of millennial reign of Jesus is when Israel enters into this covenant relationship and by the thousands upon hundreds of thousands and the, the Gentiles who've trusted Christ and those who survived the tribulation and those who died in the tribulation all are part of this marriage supper that is eventually, I believe, just pours out into the millennium. And there's this celebration. Now, the Bible says, catch this, I love what it says, for these are true words. In other words, it's the same thing Jesus said in John 14 when he's preparing his disciples. He said, listen, I'm going to go prepare a place for you so that we're at, and then I'm going to come get you. I love said, here's what he said. If this were not true, I wouldn't tell you. I mean, it's Jesus. Helpful, praise the Lord. If this weren't true, I wouldn't tell you. So, I mean, that ought to be in itself just calls for rejoicing as, as, the, as the messenger affirms it, as Jesus affirms it, as the Spirit of God affirms it. What does that mean? That means Jesus is going to do everything he said he would do, and all these scriptures that talk about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ will be fulfilled. Jesus even alludes to it in Luke chapter 22. He says, and when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. This one right before he goes to the cross, before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So at the marriage of the supper of the lamb and the marriage of the millennial age, that Jesus is going to celebrate this remembrance of a memorial meal. Now, remember, the Passover, this is the last Passover Jesus has with him. It's the last Passover in Scripture. And what happens, Jesus brings the elements of the table. And he says, you know, I want you to do this. And as often as you do this as a bride, as a family, as a body of Christ, I want you to do it in remembrance of me. And he took those two elements off the table, the bread and the wine, and he blessed them, and he shared it with them, and explained it to them what it was really all about. Now, this ties in so clearly because Jesus is telling his disciples, and especially if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, where this is the end of his earthly ministry. He's getting ready to go. He's preparing them by saying, hey, by the way, we're going to do this together again in the future. Last time here, until the kingdom, until I sit and reign as the king of kings on the throne in Israel, in Jerusalem. It's going to happen again. Is Jesus coming back soon? I believe so with all my heart. Today, we're going to celebrate. We'll come to this table. We'll bring these elements, obviously, to you. But as we do this, it's to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember what he's done. We remember yesterday. We remember the price that he paid. We remember, obviously, how he's done it in our life. And then we remember we're going to do this again. He says, as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death. 
But also, we're not only proclaiming what he did, we're proclaiming that part of this is the kingdom reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's coming. The church today has forgotten about the coming kingdom. You don't hear it preached. You don't hear it elevated. And it's amazing how few Christians have any awareness whatsoever of what we're talking about today in this room. And it's sad. We should be studying the Word of God. We should be familiarizing ourselves with the Scripture. Jesus did what he did for us 2,000 plus years ago to establish a kingdom which we're all part of and which we'll continue to be part of throughout all eternity. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah. As we come to the table of the Lord and as we think about what we've talked about with this marriage of the land, that we're going to stand there, we ought to make sure that our hearts are always ready. The apostle Paul told the Corinthian church, as mentioned a while ago in chapter 11, he said, listen, he said, you know, we should examine ourselves. We should examine ourselves to make sure that we receive the, 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 the Lord's Supper when we receive it in a worthy manner, all right? Now, worthy has to do with how, how, the, how the, our heart is right with God versus not being right with God. And not just right with God. He says, when doing this, he said, catch this, you should discern the body. What does that mean? That means not only is your communion with God important, your communion with each other is important. Your fellowship with God is important. Your fellowship with each other is important. You should make right any relationship that you have with each other. You need to make sure your heart's clean and you're keeping things right. Now, folks, that's always a challenge, by the way. Why? Because you can be just cantankerous. Me too. All right, I know. I heard you. <laughs> we can all be that way. It's within our old nature to resort to selfishness. But we have to revert from that and run to the cross of Jesus and thank God that the old nature is dead indeed unto sin, but we're now alive unto Jesus and ask God to wash us and cleanse us. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we simply deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So as we come to the table of the Lord, I would pray that our hearts would be right. So before we receive communion together, I'm going to ask you to stand with our heads bowed and our hearts open to the Lord. And I'm going to ask you just right there where you are to, so the Apostle Paul says, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, examine your heart. How are things between you and the Father today? How, how are things between you and those around you? Your family, your brothers and sisters, your brothers and sisters in Christ, the body of Christ. We don't want to deceive ourselves and say that we have no sin when we know that we're not right with the Lord. So as we prepare our hearts, if you feel like you need to take care of something with the Lord, I'm going to ask you just to come find a place to pray in the altar. There's going to be some people standing with me in the altar this morning. If you want to pray with somebody, feel free to come. Just take us by the hand and say, listen, I have a prayer need, a prayer request. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. You don't make up the bride of Christ because you've never come to receive him as your Lord and Savior. Today's a good day. The Bible says today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. In other words, let the Lord Jesus Christ into your life today. Just come and we'll lead you in a prayer of, of acceptance and repentance and come today and give your heart to Jesus Christ. There is no time like the present for your life to change for the best and for the better. Maybe you just need between you and Jesus to come find a place in the altar. So we begin to worship the Lord and begin to sing a song of worship. Why don't you just step out and come find a place to pray today. But whatever the Lord's saying, let's respond. Let's trust him. Come.
as we look back in the Word of God. I always come back to the place where Jesus is speaking to his disciples, those words that I, I have desired, as he says in that verse in Luke, to have this Passover with you. What was so special about that Passover? Because that Passover is the clear picture of what is getting ready to transpire in just hours. Just hours. You know, I, I try often to, when I, when I go back and I read these passages, to think about how the Lord was moving and operating. And, you know, if you really want to read some of those precious chapters in Scripture, read John 14, 15, 16, 17 in there. As the Lord's just ministering to the disciples there and he's speaking to them. Go ahead. And he's talking to them about, you know, these these last responsibilities, these, you know, we talk about final words and the importance of final words. These are final words that the Lord Jesus is giving to them. And in that moment when they're gathered around that, that table, it's a triclinium table, basically a three-sided, and they're sitting on both sides of it. They're on the, they're on the floor. It's the way that they would seat for the meals. So it's not like the Leonardo da Vinci painting where they're all lined up on one table, you know, and they're all facing one direction that, even that looks bizarre. Anyway, it's, a, it's, it's an intimate moment, you know, and, they're, and they're, they're, the Lord's sharing some deep things. And, and then he, he comes to the end of the Passover meal, and all that we know was so symbolic of all the sufferings of the children of Egypt and the great delivering power of God. But it was also not just reflective. They missed so much of it because it was also prophetic, you know, that there would be a lamb whose blood had to be sprinkled over the doorpost of a heart, you know. And that lamb, as John said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, that that lamb would come. And now that lamb is sitting in that upper room with them. And in, in that room where he's already come into that room and washed their feet, you know, and now they're eating. And at the end of that, he takes those two elements, the, the cup and the bread. And he, uniquely, there's four cups, all right? And th four cups. The fourth one he didn't take at Passover. It's the cup of halal. It's the, it's the cup of, 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 of hallelujah, basically. It's the one that we will take with him in the kingdom. All right? Now, that's a whole other message on prophecy. But anyway, the third cup is the cup of redemption. And he takes that and says, this is my blood. Now, you talk about when Jesus is taking the bread Remember that we talked about this bread, how it had to be prepared. It's, it's Passover bread, so it had to be prepared a certain way. It had to be, obviously, no leaven, which represented sin. So it's representing Jesus' body. He's without sin. And remember, it, was, it had to be baked in such a way on the grill so it leave the marks, all right? And so the marks were there. It represented the suffering. The oven represented the judgment, all right? The piercing represented how to be pierced for us. Even Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before Christ. And Jesus is saying about all that, this, this is, this is my body. Suffering, pierced, marked, bruised. This is my body for you. And it says the same with the cup. He took the cup and with the cup it said this is the blood of the new covenant for you. Man, what a moment. What a profound moment. Often when we share the Lord's Supper, I know you may get tired of it, but occasionally I'll reflect upon my own conversion. When I, and had the first time I received the Lord's Supper, I'd received it as growing up in church, but, but when I really got saved, you know, I gave my life to Christ, how profound that moment was of just receiving the Lord's Supper. And why was it so profound? Because... I understood really for the first time what this was really all about. And it was profound because I had just experienced, just a week before that, the most profound event in my entire life. Now, I'm pushing close to 70 now, all right? Just turned 68. That was back when I was 21. That is still the most profound event of my life. I've had some profound events, all right? 
Marriage was one of those moments. That was a profound moment. I'm still not the same. <laughs> By the way, you should be praying for her. She's still dealing with all this head and congestion stuff. It, it's profound. It was profound when my babies were born. I mean, that was mind blowing. Y'all remember when they hand you your first? How many of y'all had babies? All right. You remember when they hand you that first one, especially? Boom. I mean, I, I, I'm holding this kid, and I think, I don't know what to do with you. I'm sure glad I'm a Christian because God does. You know? But just, and then the second one, I'm, wow, just incredible moments. I mean, God has blessed me with some incredible moments in my life. I, I've, I've, I, I remember one morning standing on the, on the Sea of Galilee, the sun just coming up. And just, just had this moment with the Spirit of God. It was an amazing moment, you know. I remember waking up one morning, walking out of a hotel, walking across the street, and looking at the Sphinx and the pyramids. That was a profound moment mentally and emotionally for me. Seeing so much history in that moment that goes back to biblical. Listen, I, I remember... Probably in the early 80s, I was in Norway and went to the highest point of elevation in Norway, up on their Alps. And the snow was, it was, the air was so clean, and the snow was so dry, powdery, you could just kind of kick it like that, and it just kind of flowed into the air, and as soon as the sun would hit that little cluster, it just burst into rainbows of colors. Just profound moment. I mean, just spectacular. Watching some of you come to Jesus... That has just been mind-blowing. Pastoring has been an incredible thing. Listen, evangelism, 16 years ago, just powerful. You know, those moments in Terry Dixon and Acker up there for a bunch of them, just people coming to Christ and profound moments in time, just seeing people's lives trans. I've, I've been blessed. I kind of feel sorry for some of you. <laughs> but I have been blessed. I give the glory to God, but I'm saying... The most profound moment. I've had some incredible moments. You could collectively take my profound moments, and they still don't add up to that moment I gave my life to Jesus. I am still going through that. That's still working in me. But it all comes back to this. We'll experience the marriage of the Lamb because we experience the suffering of our Lamb. And when you stand before him on that day and you see him who suffered, and he's really no longer just the lamb, he's the lion. What a moment in time. Jesus chose these elements from the Passover to share the simplicity of the gospel with us, to remind us that when we remember him, we should remember his, this. When we remember him, we should remember his body, sinless, perfectly right before God, unblemished. We should remember his heart, his mind, his soul, his spirit. He's God in the flesh. We should remember his blood. We should remember that our sins would never be forgiven, ever. There's no hope for any of us if his blood hadn't been shed for us. Thank God for the blood of Jesus today. Thank God that he poured out it. He suffered in the agony of the cross. It poured from his brow. It poured from his hands and from his feet. It poured from his side. Without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of our sins. So when we remember today, let's remember. Let's really remember. Let's put everything else aside. And as an act of worship, let's remember Jesus. I'm going to ask the gentleman who's going to be helping me with serving this today to come at this time. When Jesus, at the end of the Lord's Supper, says he took those two elements and he took the bread. And he said, this bread is my body. I'm going to ask you to take it as you receive it. Hold it for a moment until we all receive it together as they pass it out amongst you. We just worship the Lord while they're passing this out. Let's remember Jesus. Let's remember him. Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, and what can make me whole again 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the throne that makes me white as snow. There's no Here's the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain knows nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's take this bread and hold it in front of you and just think for a moment about precious body of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we take and eat, this is not a symbol of cannibalism like we've been accused of the church before. This is a picture of faith. Faith is always represented by drinking. The Bible says, oh, everyone that thirst has come, let us drink. He that is, you know, hungry, come by without price, the bread. It's representative of our faith, our trust, our commitment to Jesus Christ. So as we share in this communion bread today, we do in remembrance of Christ. Right there with your own head bowed before the Lord. Why don't you thank the Lord? The Bible says when he took the bread, he gave thanks. Why don't you take a moment to give thanks to the Lord for his goodness? Lord, we love you. We do thank you. That you gave yourself. You presented your body on the altar. You took death upon yourself. The judgment of all sin. Because the wages of sin is death. And you died our death. We eat this today, Father, in remembrance of your son, Jesus. And Jesus, as we speak clearly to you, we thank you for what you did. And we remember you. It's in your name. Would you take and eat? The Bible says in like manner. That he took the cup, and I'm sure that manner was a manner of humility. These gentlemen pass this out to you. Again, ask you to take it and wait for a moment. We'll receive it together. We thank the Lord together. Amazing grace, Lord, how sweet the sound. That sin a wretch like me. I was, was lost, woe, but now I found. I was blind.
God says it was not with the blood of bulls and goats that we were redeemed, but by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Redeemed, it means to be purchased, to be brought back. We were sold into slavery because of sin. We were under the headship of the enemy of God, Satan. The Bible says we were by nature the children of wrath. But when we come to Christ, we're set free from that bondage. We were made new in Christ Jesus. For if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away, and all things have become new. But they become new because of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This precious blood that he's given is all throughout Scripture. From Genesis 1 to the book of Revelation, there's a clear red thread that goes through the Word of God. Everything we experience in our life is due to the fact that Jesus gave this ultimate price his blood for our sin. For without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, there's no removal of sin. So as we take this today and receive this, we remember the precious blood that was poured out for our sins. We do this as an act of faith, we do it as an act of worship, and we do it as an act of honor and love that we have for our Lord and Savior. So let's give thanks to him. In your own heart, by your own words, would you just take and tell the Lord thank you for his sacrifice for your sin. Realize that it was for you. Just on your own words in your own heart, take a moment to worship him and to let him know that you do this in remembrance of him. Lord, we realize that in taking this today, we preach a message of life. But we know there would be no life if you had not given your life. There would be no hope the God of all hope hadn't sent his son. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We do what we do in remembrance of you today. We do it to honor you. We do it as an act of worship, love, and faith. It's in Jesus' name which you take and drink in remembrance of Christ. And would you stand? Let's sing that last chorus. When we've been there 10,000 years, you gentlemen can be seen. When we've been there for 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, you have known less days just to sing His praise than when we Sing praise God again. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Lift it up. Praise God. 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 Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Somebody shout, somebody say amen, somebody praise the Lord. Amen. Take that, devil. Amen. You may be seated. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Hallelujah. I know we have a few closing announcements and I uh, want to say from the church, from the staff, happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Make it a meaningful Thanksgiving as you gather with friends or family, whoever it might be. Take time to give the Lord glory in that celebration somewhere that you honor him. I don't think it's on our announcement. I will be preaching Tuesday night at a community. We don't have any Wednesday night service, right? I'll be Tuesday night at a community Thanksgiving service preaching there in Magnolia at the Magnolia Bible Church. So I think that's at 7 p.m. If you want to come out, be a part of that. You feel welcome to come on out. Amen. We'll do a little preaching. Praise the Lord. All right, a couple of closing announcements. First is the Kids Lock-In. That is December December 6th through the 7th. If you want more information about that, please see Pastor Matt. Also, please continue to be in prayer for your Christmas offering. Uh, <coughs> I guess now you're my That Christmas. works. <laughs> <laughs> Belize Mission Trip is coming up in March. And so uh, the deadline 
if you're interested in going, the deadline for us to know, because we have to start releasing tickets back to United, is December 4th. And so that does require a deposit. So any adult, we, we will always need help with street witnessing and also with counselors at the Revival. It's a great time. We're going March 7th to the 13th. So if you're interested, just contact the church for more information. Don't forget to check your bulletin and website for more important and, and for important upcoming events. Also, the food pantry wanted me to announce that the bags will be out there next week. You know, about once or twice a year, they put the bags out there so that we can replenish what the food pantry has. And so around this is the time where we truly, really try to just bless those that, that need that extra. And so uh, just be uh, aware of that. And, and as you're shopping, get those bags next week. And, and there's already a, a uh, shopping list of what they need upstairs. And so for more information, please see the Phillips or the Gutierrez's uh, regarding that. Uh, for those brand new to our first time visitors, there is a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. Uh, ask that you fill that out. And after we dismiss, our pastor would love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, and put a free gift in your hand. With that being said, don't forget there's food or, or pantry items in the kitchen. Still little Debbie's, I'm assuming, because we got a ton of them. And, and so Take them. Uh, that, that'll be your Thanksgiving uh, snack and, and, and dessert. So with that being said, don't forget your tithes and offerings. We don't pass a plate around here. Uh, there are offering receptacles in the back and continue to just be just honoring the Lord. The Lord has blessed us with so much, amen. And so it's his anyway. So let's just continue to, to, to uh, be faithful to what God has told us to do. With that being said, you are dismissed. I have unanswered prayers I have trouble I wish wasn't there those stones do you ever hear, see those those emotional stones or whatever don't be that right so don't let her emotions dictate your emotions right if, if she's like that hey i'm sorry what can i you know you know what i mean so hey thanks for letting me help out man. i just yeah i noticed that's like the last couple weeks of the just going through it yeah right don't don't let that don't let her dictate you know in, in, a, in a positive way don't get mad at her but just be like you know what can I? What can I do? Oh, they changed things about me. It's just it's something in the mood. Like, ain't nothing I can do about it. Yeah. Like, well, then just you know. But the thing is, you can't let her, let that, not her. You can't let that dictate how you feel. Because right. then it's going to be frustrating. Right. It's it's maddening and it's, it's make, makes you upset. <laughs>